Ladies and gentlemen, now let's start with the second part on our lecture on the more stress diagram. And uh, now we are looking at the diagram itself in uh, detail. Uh, here we see uh, fairly complex graphics uh, with uh, a XY diagram, a number of lines, uh, semicircles here, and uh, a lot of uh, cryptic uh, abbreviations. Let's try and walk through this diagram uh, bit by bit. On the uh, y-axis of the diagram, we see uh, the shear stress. Usually that is given in megapascals. Sometimes you will find uh, older diagrams uh, that still use kilobars. Uh, we see on the uh, x-axis of the diagram the normal stress, uh, also usually in kilobars. And here we see a positive part of it and we see a negative section on the left-hand side of the origin of the diagram. Uh, the uh, negative part for the normal stress would indicate uh, tensile stresses, the positive part compressive stresses. Uh, shear stresses cannot be compressive or tensile because they are acting uh, parallel to a potential shear plane or to a real shear plane. Uh, we uh, will learn a little bit more about that uh, on the next slide. Uh, these shear stresses and normal stresses that are shown here, they, they refer to the stresses acting on real or on hypothetical potential shear planes of uh, any kind of orientation. Uh, also, this we will learn to use uh, in, uh, on the next slides. Uh, then we have here these uh, linear or curving failure envelopes. Uh, these are the tensile failure envelope, the transitional tensile failure envelope, the Coulomb failure envelope, and the envelope of sliding friction. And in, in the previous parts of the uh, course, we have talked about these different kind of failure types as they occur in, uh, in rocks and uh, along fractures. The tensile failure envelope, TFE, is a vertical line that we always find in the negative part of the uh, stress diagram. Uh, it's a vertical line that always intersects on, on the left-hand side of the normal stress axis, typically at values of about minus 5, minus 10, sometimes up to minus 20 megapascals. That would be the tensile failure envelope. The transitional tensile failure envelope forms a parabolic curve that hits the vertical shear stress axis uh, at a certain point, uh, sigma O, that is the name for that point, uh, which we call the cohesive strength. Also that we discuss in more detail a bit later. At this point, at the uh, cohesive strength point here on the uh, shear stress axis, we see the beginning of the Coulomb failure envelope, which is a, a linear failure envelope that um, has a slope that is usually around 30 degrees, a little bit shallower than the envelope of sliding friction, which is a straight line that goes through the origin of the more stressed diagram. The three failure envelopes, they represent rock failure according to uh, different modes that we have discussed earlier. Uh, the tensile failure envelope obviously will illustrate conditions for tensile failure, simply tensile opening of a fracture perpendicular to the fracture surface, transitional tensile failure along the parabolic shaped transitional tensile failure envelope indicates failure by tensile opening in combination with lateral shearing along the uh, shear plane. Coulomb failure is uh, failure along a fracture surface and displacement along a, a fracture surface without a tensile opening component and displacement is uh, fully achieved by lateral shearing. What is important to understand is that these uh, failure envelopes and their positions have to be determined um, experimentally for uh, each individual rock type. Uh, most rock types will have failure envelopes that plot uh, 
roughly in the same area with the same kind of orientation. So what you see here is representative for most rocks, but uh, depending on their shear strength, depending on their composition, depending on their grain size, uh, grade of weathering, for instance, all that uh, will change the physical properties of rocks and the failure envelopes that we see here characterize and describe the failure conditions for these rocks. So these are the physical properties of the rocks themselves. Here we see uh, the Mohr circle with a maximum principal stress sigma 1 of about 63 megapascals, a minimum principal stress a sigma 3 of uh, 34 megapascals, and that describes the stress conditions acting on that specific rock. We see here that the semicircle that connects uh, the maximum and the minimum uh, stresses in these rocks uh, are far away from any kind of uh, failure envelope. Uh, also, uh, this semicircle is uh, far away from the envelope of sliding friction. This is a stress condition that would be stable. The rock could withstand these stresses without rock failure and even if there are fractures present in that rock, none of these fractures would slide. We see here now an arrow that would move uh, the uh, Mohr circle from its uh, original position here to a position further to the left. Uh, this is something that can happen if poor fluid pressures are high and that will weaken the rock and will make it behave uh, like a rock that is under much lower stress conditions and very different stress conditions that perhaps lead to rock failure. This is a matter that we are going to discuss in the third part of this lecture series on the Mohr stress diagram. And uh, I only want to mention it uh, for now that something like that uh, may happen. We discuss it in detail later. Let's start with the stresses and the uh, fracture orientations that we might find in rocks. And uh, here we see a, a simplified version of the uh, Mohr stress diagram. It doesn't show the uh, failure envelopes. It only shows stresses in the Mohr stress diagram. And uh, let's look at this red Mohr circle. We now see not only the upper part of the Mohr stress diagram that we have seen on in the previous slide, we also see a mirrored bottom part of the Mohr circle. And here we see that the uh, shear stresses that have a positive sign over here have a negative sign uh, at the uh, lower segment of the shear stress axis. Uh, as I said before, shear stresses cannot uh, be compressive or uh, tensile uh, because they act parallel to fracture surfaces and uh, therefore cannot dilate or compress. Here the positive and negative sign are symbolic and they uh, do not mean uh, compression or tension. They also are not mathematical, positive and negatives. They relate to the presence of conjugated faults. Um, I will talk uh, more about that in a moment. Let's first look through the uh, features that are shown here in this diagram. We see here again a minimum principal stress uh, plotted on the Mohr stress diagram here. In this position, the uh, sigma 1 maximum principal stress is over here, and through these two points, we have drawn a full circle that also goes here through the bottom half of the diagram. We see here the center of this circle and uh, this central position here is called the mean stress. That is simply uh, half of the sum of sigma 1 and sigma 3. That would give us the stress in the middle of the Mohr circle. And then of course we see here the diameter of the Mohr circle which illustrates the differential stress. That is the maximum minus the minimum uh, principal stress. That means a rock that is exposed to a large differential stress will have a large Mohr circle, a uh, Mohr circle that has only a very small differential stress, stress will show a 
smaller Mohr circle and a hydrostatic stress condition would be just a point on the sigma m axis somewhere because uh, there we don't have a difference between the largest and smallest principal stress. Then we have this uh, line drawn here. The line that we see here uh, connecting the center of the Mohr circle with the perimeter of the Mohr circle can be drawn in any direction in the uh, Mohr stress diagram and that represents shear planes shear planes in a specific orientation with respect to sigma 1. The angle that we use to define the orientation of the shear plane is 2 theta and uh, we remember theta is an important angle. 1 theta describes the angle between sigma 1 and the shear plane itself. This theta is uh, the same like this theta for graphical reasons in the more stress diagram, uh, this angle is always twice as large than the angle in uh, such an experimental setup, for instance. I do not want to explain the, the geometrical reasons for that uh, at this point. What we have to know is that in the more stress diagram, this angle is always 2 theta if we want to uh, determine uh, the 1 theta angle in uh, such a real life situation the angle between sigma 1 and the shear plane we just need to divide this angle by 2. We also can uh, in a mirrored orientation draw a second shear plane towards the bottom of the more stress diagram. Again we uh, use the 2 theta angle only that we now measure here from the uh, side on the to the left of the mean stress in a counterclockwise direction. This would be a minus 2 theta angle. Again, this minus is conventional, not mathematical, and it refers to the minus uh, for the lower part of the shear stress axis. This refers here to a conjugated shear fracture, or fault if you want, uh, that is uh, oriented at the same theta angle uh, that we see here, just in the opposite direction. We have seen conjugated uh, faults in previous lectures. Here we see them again in our block diagram. A, a conjugated fracture in this situation uh, would have the same angular relationship to sigma 1 and sigma 3 uh, just in the opposite direction, where one fault forms a mirror image of the other. The normal stresses are acting on uh, these uh, surfaces are identical and also the shear stresses are the same, but we see here that the shear stress is acting in a top to the right uh, direction, whereas the shear stress here uh, on the conjugated fault is acting in a top to the left or hanging wall to the left direction. And uh, in order to distinguish these two shear stresses, this one gets a negative sign. They are exchangeable. Whichever you would plot first would get the positive sign. Whichever you plot second would get the negative sign. Uh, and also depending here on whether the one is plotted at the bottom or at the top part of the more stress diagram. One is a positive shear stress, the other one is a negative shear stress. But in magnitude, these shear stresses are identical. We are going to see that uh, a few sli slides later when we uh, apply these principal geometrical relationships uh, to uh, more analytical uh, purposes. Let's play a little bit longer, longer with these uh, simplified more stress diagrams, uh, again without the failure envelopes here. Uh, we can plot different kinds of stresses. Uh, here in the uh, first diagram we see hydrostatic stresses. If we assume that uh, sigma 1 uh, and sigma 2 and sigma 3 all are identical in magnitude, uh, the uh, corresponding Mohr circle would be a point. Uh, the stress could be low, 
The stress could be high as long as all three principal stresses are identical and we have hydrostatic stress conditions, we would form points on the sigma 1 axis uh, further down for shadow crustal conditions uh, at higher sigma n, uh, deeper in the crust where stresses are higher. The corresponding stress ellipsoid would be a sphere. It would be a small sphere in shallow crustal conditions with low um, hydrostatic stresses or a larger sphere a bit deeper in the crust where the stresses are higher. Then we have uniaxial stresses. Uh, uniaxial stresses are those where two stress vectors, R0, are falling onto the origin of the Mohr stress diagram. And uh, uniaxial compressive stresses will show a sigma 1 that is compressive, therefore plotting on the positive side of the sigma n axis, like in this example here. The shape of the corresponding stress ellipsoid would be a line because uh, we would have uh, one positive value for sigma 1 and a zero value for sigma 2 and 3, uh, which are falling uh, onto the origin of the diagram. And since they have uh, a value of zero pascal, the uh, shape of that stress ellipsoid would be a line. If we have a uniaxial tensile stress, we cannot draw a stress ellipsoid because uh, the maximum stress acting on such a rock would be zero and then there would be a pulling force, a negative sigma 3. And uh, a negative stress value cannot be shown as a vector that is part of a stress ellipsoid. That means here in this case there is no stress ellipsoid that would illustrate these tensile uniaxial conditions. We can take that further. We see here axial stresses uh, that have two magnitudes of stress. Here, for instance, uh, sigma 2 and sigma 3 are of equal magnitude and are fairly uh, small. And sigma 1 is larger than these two others. Uh, that would produce a rotational ellipsoid as a stress ellipsoid. Sigma 1 would be larger and the two others are smaller and are uh, of the same magnitude. That means it's a circular cross-section through a, such a stress ellipsoid. The same could happen uh, that uh, if sigma 3 has a small value compared to a higher sigma 1 that equals sigma 2. Also this would be an axial stress. The shape of the uh, stress ellipsoid uh, would obviously be uh, different. We would have uh, two long axes and one smaller axis forming that stress ellipsoid. Uh, we could have axial stresses also uh, under tensile conditions uh, the largest stress might be tensile, the smaller two stresses, sigma 2 and sigma 3, even more tensile. Again, here we couldn't draw a stress ellipsoid. And then there are triaxial stresses, where sigma 2, sigma 3 and sigma 1 all have different magnitudes. And uh, we can plot all three stresses here on uh, the sigma n axis of the Mohr stress diagram. Obviously sigma 3 always furthest to the left because it's the smallest value. Uh, sigma 1 would be the largest value and sigma 2 would be somewhere in between, not necessarily right in the middle. In this example it just happened to plot at the position of the mean stress, right in the middle of the Mohr circle. And if we have uh, triaxial stresses then we also can draw smaller more, more circles uh, between sigma 2 and sigma 1 or between uh, sigma 3 and sigma 2, which then would give us the differential stresses between the two smaller ones or the two larger principal stresses. But uh, for rock failure and uh, for rock stability, the maximum differential stress 
defined by the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3 is the most important. The corresponding stress ellipsoid for triaxial stresses obviously would be a ellipso an ellipsoid in which all three axes are different in magnitude. So, in uh, axial stresses we would always have a circular cross-section in the triaxial stresses the cross-section uh, perpendicular to sigma 1 would be elliptical. Now let's again add the failure envelopes and here on the left hand side we uh, meet again the uh, three failure envelopes that we already have met before the tensile the parabolic or a transitional tensile failure envelope and the Coulomb failure envelope and we find here a fourth one the von Mise failure envelope which uh, after a gradual curve uh, forms a horizontal line here at fairly high shear stresses and uh, we see the con corresponding von Mise failure envelope here on the negative half of the more stress diagram. Uh, we also see uh, all the other failure envelopes uh, that we have seen in the positive shear stress half of the uh, more stress diagram uh, also occur in mirrored geometry and in the bottom half. Again, the bottom half is uh, only needed in order to consider conjugated uh, fractures and faults, as we will see later. What applies to all of these failure envelopes is that uh, they define the condition under which a rock would fail. That means any more circle that touches any of these failure envelopes will define stress conditions that may lead to failure uh, of the rock. What we see here is that uh, the further we go from the right hand to the left hand side, of the more stress diagram, the critical more circles, more circles that uh, touch the failure envelopes become smaller and smaller and smaller until we see here very small more circles that touch here the tensile and the transitional tensile failure envelope in the negative half of the more stress diagram. Uh, a little bit more dramatic, we see here uh, this illustrated um, only for the, for the Coulomb failure envelope. Whenever a Mohr circle is large enough to touch it, uh, the rock will fail. Mohr circles or stress conditions that are represented by Mohr circles uh, that are uh, far away from these uh, failure envelopes represent uh, stable stress conditions. These rocks might undergo some elastic uh, deformation perhaps, uh, but they will not fracture and they will not reactivate fractures uh, unless they come uh, close to the respective failure envelopes. That is the main purpose of the uh, more stress diagram is uh, to uh, plot the specific failure envelopes that are valid for a specific rock and the uh, critical or non-critical stresses that either lead to failure when the more circles are touching a failure envelope or that represent stable conditions like the yellow one here on the left hand side uh, that are far removed from any failure envelope. Let's look a little bit further what we can do with uh, the more circles and the failure envelopes in the more stress diagram. Uh, let's pick out this red more circle here. A fairly large uh, sigma 1, a fairly uh, moderate uh, sigma 3, but uh, both uh, sigma 3 and sigma 1 are compressive stresses as we typically find them in the earth crust. Uh, so both of them plot on the positive side of the sigma n axis. And uh, we can see when we draw that uh, more circle, it just touches the Coulomb failure envelope. And uh, what we can do is we can uh, draw connecting lines from the center of the uh, more circle, from the mean stress, to the point 
where the failure envelope is touched. That will define the orientation of the fracture that will form under these stress conditions. So if the rock is expo exposed to this sigma 1 and this sigma 3, new fractures will form in these positions. And these positions are defined by the 2 theta angle. We see here in this example 2 theta is 60 or if you want the conjugated fracture that we see here in the bottom half minus uh, 60 degrees. This is a definition of the fracture orientation with respect to sigma 1. We have seen that in the graphics before. The angle theta is the angle between the fracture and the largest principal stress vector sigma 1. We can do even more. We can uh, determine from the orientation of the fractures hitting the failure envelopes in these two positions what kind of shear stresses and normal stresses will act on these positions. When we uh, look for instance here at uh, this point here for the uh, upper fracture, at this point we have a critical shear stress acting of 39 megapascals. Under these stress conditions that make this rock fail uh, on the fracture oriented at a 2 theta of 60 or 1 theta of 30 degrees with respect to sigma 1, a shear stress of 39 megapascal would act. The same applies to the conjugated fault that intersects the more envelope uh, down here. Here we see that a equal uh, shear stress, critical shear stress of 39 megapascal acts on this conjugated fault plane, but the shear sense would be opposite. That is symbolized by the minus before the 39 megapascals. So if we can determine the critical shear stress on the fracture that has formed, we also can determine the critical normal stress. And the critical normal stress for these two fractures would be 45 megapascals. So it's a very simple exercise. We just find the position where the uh, critical shear plane intersects with the failure envelope. And uh, horizontally, we can read the shear stress. And vertically, we can read uh, the critical normal stress acting on these planes. And we can see here, for this example, the critical normal stress acting onto these fractures is a positive stress. It's a compressive stress. And that will prevent any dilation along these fracture surface. That is because we are intersecting the Coulomb failure envelope. And the characteristic of Coulomb failure is that we are sliding parallel to the fracture surface. This is illustrated by our 39 megapascals of shear stress but we cannot open up the fracture. We cannot create space, for instance, to form a vein because of the compressive stress, the compressive normal stress of 45 megapascals keeping the fracture tightly closed. Let's have a look at a different example. Let's have a look at uh, tensile stress conditions. Uh, here in this example, we only uh, look at the uh, tensile failure envelope. Uh, this is here, this uh, vertical line. And in this case, uh, the rock has been tested and uh, it has shown that this rock forms tensile fractures uh, at a tensile stress of minus 10 megapascals. This is a fairly normal value that you will find in many common rocks. Uh, the point at which the tensile strength failure envelope, or sometimes only called tensile failure envelope, where this vertical line intersects with the uh, horizontal normal stress axis of the more stress diagram. That is where we find the value TO. That is called the fundamental tensile strength. 
This is a very important uh, mechanical uh, parameter for all rocks. That is one of the values that are determined in tensile strength tests. And uh, once you know this uh, value, minus 10 megapascals, you simply can draw a vertical line in the more stress diagram and you find your tensile strength failure envelope. Now let's test this rock. Uh, let's uh, start at uh, unconfined conditions. Uh, we are running here an unconfined tensile strength test. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, at the beginning of the test, uh, all stresses are uh, zero. We start our test at uh, sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 um, of the magnitude of zero megapascals. That means our rock sits at the origin. Then we start pulling. We are starting to pull in the sigma 3 direction. And that means sigma 3 becomes more and more and more negative. And the corresponding more circles that we could draw for this tensile strength test would become larger and larger and larger. But uh, the upper end of the more circles always would remain at zero because our maximum uh, principal stress uh, would remain zero. We are just pulling our sample laterally apart. And the more we pull, the larger the more circles become. And once they become large enough to reach minus 10 megapascals for sigma 3, the rock will touch the tensile strength failure envelope and will fracture. It will fracture by mode 1 failure perpendicular to sigma 3. We have seen that in earlier chapters of this lecture series. Tensile failure always occurs perpendicular to sigma 3. What we also can see uh, is that at the point of intersection here at the tensile failure envelope uh, that no shear stresses are acting on that fracture because if we draw a horizontal line from the intersection point over to the shear stress axis, we will find a value of zero, no shear stresses. And that is also something we know already about mode one fractures. They just open perpendicular to the fracture surface. They do not show any lateral sliding along the fracture surface. So that is uh, simply the uh, tensile strength test that we have uh, heard about before, uh, graphically shown in the Mohr stress diagram. We are starting at uh, zero stresses and we start pulling until we reach the failure criterion for tensile failure. The fundamental tensile strength, uh, TO, uh, for most rocks uh, ranges in a narrow uh, space of about minus 5 to minus 20 megapascals. The law for tensile failure is uh, as simple as it could be. Uh, as soon as sigma 3 reaches the fundamental tensile strength, the rock will fail. Let's have a look at uh, slightly varied conditions in our tensile strength test. Uh, here we see we are not starting our tensile strength test at a confining stress of zero megapascals like before. We now have compressive stresses, all side compressive stresses at the beginning of the test. So at the start of our test, all our principal stresses are the same, but they are no longer zero. They are 10 megapascals. They plot as a point over here at 10. Under these compressive stresses, we now start releasing stress in one direction and eventually start pulling the rock sample in the sigma 3 direction. And uh, again, our more circles will start growing and they will grow again here to the left hand side because sigma 3 is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller until it eventually hits the failure criterion for uh, the tensile failure. And uh, 
when it touches the tensile failure envelope here at the, this point, uh, we will form a fracture. We will form the same kind of tensile fracture that we have seen earlier. This can go on for uh, increasing sigma 1s, but uh, sigma 1 must not exceed the value of three times the fundamental tensile strength. So if uh, our fundamental tensile strength is minus 10 megapascals, sigma 1 must not exceed 30 megapascals. So if we have 10 here, 20, 30, as soon as uh, sigma 1 uh, is at uh, 30 megapascals or higher, no more tensile failure will be possible. And uh, we will see on the next slide why this is so. But uh, it's important for you to remember this relationship for all stress conditions where sigma 1 does not exceed three times the fundamental tensile strength, the only failure type that can happen is tensile failure. Another point that is uh, important, and I want to stress that again here, uh, here we see uh, just a magnified part of the negative of uh, this more stress diagram. Again, when we connect the point of failure here at this position, uh, we get a orientation of two theta of zero degrees. Uh, if we measure that angle between the normal stress axis and uh, the fracture plane, they are parallel. Uh, one, the fracture plane sits right on the sigma n axis and that means two theta is zero. If two theta, theta is zero, then the angle between uh, the fracture and sigma three is 90 degrees because the fractures are parallel to sigma one and sigma one is perpendicular to sigma three. So let's briefly come back to uh, this diagram that we have uh, seen before uh, discussing uh, various different fracture types and at the moment we are clearly here in the uh, tensile fracture part of the diagram at uh, low confining pressures and uh, what we see here are the tensile fractures that form parallel to uh, sigma 1 and perpendicular to sigma 3 and uh, we now have learned in the more stress diagram that the uh, uh, sigma 3 stresses in fact are negative. They are tensile and that means the uh, stress vectors actually should point outwards. Uh, a little bit later in the next section of this uh, lecture we are going to learn that these compressive sigma 3 stresses actually are not quite wrong. Uh, they have their reason, but uh, we will come back to that at a later stage. Factually, we have seen in the more stress diagram that tensile failure always happens when the tensile failure envelope is intersected by the more circle, and that happens on the left-hand side of the more stress diagram in the negative part of the normal stress. And if we have a negative normal stress, then this is a tensile stress. Let's take our experiment a little bit further. Let's increase the maximum principal stress to a value that is more than three times the fundamental tensile strength. And uh, we are still looking at the same rock. The fundamental tensile strength of this rock is again minus 10 megapascals. But now sigma 1 lies at 40 megapascals. And if we now try to increase uh, the Mohr circle by decreasing sigma 3 to such an extent that the Mohr circle intersects with a failure envelope, we will find that not the vertical line of the tensile failure envelope is intersected, but the parabolic shape of the transitional tensile failure envelope. So as soon as sigma 1 exceeds 3 times a TO, uh, but does not exceed 5 times TO, uh, the intersection of the Mohr circle will take place 
along the parabolic curve of the transitional tensile failure envelope. And transitional tensile failure means that we have a shear stress acting on these uh, surfaces. That means lateral sliding along the fracture surface. But we also see that here when we look at the critical normal stress uh, that we are still in the tensile field. Intersection of the parabolic failure envelope either in uh, such a position here or in uh, such a position uh, means that the normal stress acting on these fractures is tensile and that means opening dilation of the fractures. In our uh, example uh, that we see here, we see that illustrated. Conjugated fractures are forming. Uh, they are bisected by sigma 1 in the acute angle and they have a lateral shearing component, top to the left for this fracture, top to the right for this fracture. And both of them also have a component of tensile opening because the normal stress acting on them is a tensile one. It's a negative stress. It is important to notice that a theta is now no longer zero degrees, as we have seen in tensile failure. Uh, the uh, fractures that intersect with the uh, parabolic failure envelope show a, a two theta angle, in this case of 32 degrees. And that means uh, in our rock sample that we uh, see here undergoing deformation, the angle between sigma 1 and the fracture surface is 1 theta, 16 degrees on either side of the sigma 1 stress vector. We can increase uh, sigma 1 uh, to a maximum of uh, 50 megapascals until the Mohr circle becomes so large that it doesn't fit anymore into the parabolic failure envelope. And that is what we are going to see on the next slide. But before we get there, let's look at the law of failure. This is a much more complex law of failure. The critical uh, shear stress that uh, we see here uh, that is required for failure is a square root of a more complex term that involves the uh, normal stresses, the critical normal stress, and the fundamental tensile strength, um, which uh, is uh, which you can calculate. This formula is so complicated because the formula describes the shape of this parabolic curve. Before we come uh, to the Coulomb failure envelope, let's have a quick look at uh, our diagram from before. We now have increased the confining pressure. Our um, stresses are between uh, uh, three and five times the uh, fundamental tensile strength and we are now in the transitional tensile failure envelope uh, environment. We intersect the parabolic failure envelope and that produces these transitional tensile failures with lateral shearing and tensile opening. And also here we still have negative sigma 3 stresses, tensile sigma 3 stresses acting uh, on the fracture surface. Now the Coulomb failure envelope is uh, much more straightforward. It uh, starts where the parabolic failure envelope ends and uh, this point on the uh, shear stress axis is called uh, sigma O and uh, the law of failure is uh, fairly straightforward. It uh, uh, describes the slope of this line, which is the tangent of the slope angle times sigma n. That means uh, the further we go down the sigma n axis, uh, the higher is our critical shear stress uh, that leads to failure. So sigma c again is the critical shear stress. Uh, sigma n is uh, simply how far we are going down the sigma n axis and that is multiplied with the tangent of the angle phi, the slope angle uh, of the Coulomb 
law of failure. Uh, because the failure envelope uh, does not start at the origin, we have to add sigma o. This is this point that is just added to this term and we have a mathematical description of the Coulomb failure envelope. The term sigma o that we see here, that uh, starting point of the Coulomb failure envelope is called the cohesive strength. And we have talked a lot about cohesion in rocks that must be overcome in order to form a fracture. Here we find exactly this value. Uh, sigma O is the strength of the rock, the shear strength of the rock at a normal stress of zero acting on the planes. That is the definition of the cohesive strength and it is symbolized by the value of uh, the end of the parabolic failure envelope and the beginning of the Coulomb failure envelope, a point on the shear stress axis. Of course we find sigma o also on the negative side of the more stress diagram. Uh, this slope angle is called phi. The Greek letter phi uh, is a value that again derives from experimental work. Uh, for each rock, or at least for each rock type, uh, you should look up the appropriate uh, angle phi and this angle phi is uh, variable again within limitations between about 25 and 35 degrees. Uh, phi is called the angle of internal friction. So another technical term that is important because it defines the slope of the failure envelope and as we will see in a minute also the orientation of fractures that are likely to fall in a rock. We see here uh, this uh, interval of angles uh, in which phi can be found, 25 to 35 degrees, uh, translates to a tangent phi that we need for the law of the failure and uh, this tangent uh, of phi is called the coefficient of internal friction. And if uh, phi lies between 25 and 35 degrees, the tangent of these values uh, are between 0.47 and 0.70. So a lot of uh, new terms, a lot of uh, new descriptors, uh, all of them are important and you should uh, ensure that you are familiar with these terms and with their meaning. Let's apply a little bit more geometry to the Coulomb law of failure. Uh, we know that uh, most faults that we find in nature are Coulomb faults. Uh, they have formed under compressive stresses and they do not show a uh, component of tensile opening. Uh, let's have a look why we often find a 30 degree angle between sigma 1 and the false or a 60 degree angle between conjugated false. Uh, this is a simple ge geometrical relationship between the Coulomb failure envelope and the critical stresses that lead to rock failure. There are simple angular relationships. Uh, if we have a uh, an internal angle of friction phi of 30 degrees, we will find that this angle here becomes 60 degrees. And uh, if we uh, look at the geometrical relationship between the green triangle and the orange triangle, they are similar. They contain the same angles, only that we find phi here in the upper part in the acute angle of this triangle and 2 theta we find down here. And we know that 2 theta is important because 2 theta describes the orientation of the fracture with respect to sigma 1. So if we have understood that, then we will understand the relationship between uh, the fracture 
uh, the fracture orientation and the Coulomb law of failure. If we have a internal angle of friction of 30 degrees, that means that two theta become 60 degrees, or one theta is 30 degrees, and that is what we commonly find between sigma one and the fault surface. You might remember this relationship from our earlier lectures where we were looking at uh, this diagram uh, and uh, when we were wondering why in the brittle field do we find 30 degrees between uh, sigma 1 and the falls and shear fractures that would fall now under compressive sigma 3 stresses. Using the more stress diagram I think this becomes evident. The slope angle of the Coulomb law of failure determines the 2 theta angle of 60 or the 1 theta angle of 30 degrees. And uh, yes, we can have some variations. It's not always exactly 30 degrees because if we have a smaller uh, internal angle of friction, then the slope of the Coulomb law of failure becomes shallower and 2 theta becomes larger. Otherwise, where if we increase the internal angle of friction to, say, 35 degrees, then the slope of the Coulomb law of failure will become uh, steeper, and accordingly, 2 theta will become smaller. And that gives this angle between uh, sigma 1 and the fracture a, a little variation of about plus minus 5 degrees, and that is why we say approximately 30 degrees between sigma 1 and the fracture in the brittle field. Let's come to our last failure envelope, von Mises' failure envelope, uh, the horizontal line that we find at high normal stresses. Uh, in order to intersect with von Mises' failure envelope, we need fairly large differential stresses, which means large more circles. And if we intersect with such a large differential stress, or the corresponding more circle, von Mises' failure envelope, we will find that the intersection happens at the highest point of the more circle at an interface angle of 2 theta of 90 degrees. And this point is the maximum shear stress that can be created by the stress field uh, that is now intersecting here from Mises' failure envelope. Remember, uh, intersecting any other failure envelope would not produce the maximum shear stress acting on the fracture surface. Here, for instance, in uh, Coulomb failure, uh, we see the shear stress acting on this fracture is not at the top of the Mohr circle. This is not the maximum shear stress that the stress field can create. Uh, it is a combination of a critical normal stress and a uh, critical shear stress that causes failure in the Coulomb regime. And uh, again we come here to the 45 degrees in the ductile field and ductile failure always happens as von Mises failure. This is plastic shearing, this is not longer fracturing. Coalescence of microfractures does not play any role. Barreling uh, does not play a role in the plastic field. And that is why we are shearing in the plastic field at 45 degrees with respect to sigma 1. That is the maximum shear stress that can be resolved uh, in a given stress field. I believe that was uh, quite a lot of uh, information, uh, but uh, this is essentially the way the more stress diagram is uh, working and uh, that is how the uh, four failure envelopes work and correspond to the different failure types that we have discussed earlier. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and your patience in this uh, rather technical section.